So welcome everyone. My name is Dan Ambrosini. I'm a uh, postdoc research fellow at the program on the legal profession. So I'm incredibly delighted to welcome to welcome you all to our uh, speaker series um, that we hold every week. I see some of you have been here before. And so this week I'm uh, very delighted to invite um, uh, uh, Myra, Dr. Myra White, who is a Harvard professor, a clinical instructor, um, an author, columnist. Uh, she's a speaker. Um, She's taught on issues of leadership, virtual teams, workplace performance. Let me give you just a brief introduction here. Uh, Dr. White is a clinical instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she's an honorary professor at uh, uh, Jiangxi University of International Finance, Economics. She uh, teaches at the Harvard Extension School uh, courses in organizational behavior, man managing virtual teams. In 2007, she was the Harvard recipient of the Joanna Fusa uh, Distinguished Teaching Award. 2010, she was selected as Woman of the Year by Harvard, Harvard Women's Empowerment Network. She, as you can see, is a graduate of Harvard Law School. She also holds a PhD in psychology from the Department of Psychology, Harvard's Department of Psychology, and I believe has a, a degrees in computer and electrical engineering from Northwestern. So, uh, <laughs> super talent here. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> she uh, most recently has been working with training programs for executives in India, China, Brazil, and. Uh, her new book, The Superstar Roadmap, How Ordinary People Build Extraordinary Careers. Uh, she has a quote in it that I love. She says, we all have a bit of superstar hidden in our genes. We just need to know how to bring it to life. So maybe she'll tell us how to do that. Um, and I do want to say also, in addition to all of that, um, uh, Dr. White is a formidable hockey player who played for Harvard's women, Harvard women's hockey team. So we could have used you this week on the Harvard Law Med team uh, since we lost so badly. So, uh, uh, but uh, Dr. White, take it away. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk today about talent and the kind of issues that law firms have in finding talent and developing it and recruiting it, and uh, which uh, some of you have probably already experienced and will in the future. Uh, when you think about it, law firms actually really, what they do is they sell talent. Large law firms, now I want to qualify it by saying large firms, you know, are in the business of providing high-end legal talent. So this is what they're looking for when they're trying to recruit people, uh, develop them, retain them. Their whole goal is to provide talent-based services, which, are, which is in a way is different if you think about it as a different kind of business than selling iPhones, where you have a product that's well-defined. Whereas talent is not well-defined, and we have a lot of issues as to really what is talent and what is legal talent. And law firms, in many ways, struggle with this. In the past, what they've done is, as you're all familiar with, I'm sure some of you have all already been through the recru recruiting and uh, courting process. Uh, I assume it still goes on as intensely as it did in the past uh, when I was a law student. But you're all familiar with the process where uh, larger law firms their strategy has traditionally been to recruit from places like Harvard, Yale, uh, top tier law schools. And then in the past, what they've done is they've overhired. In other words, they've hired more associates than they ever think will make partner. And then once you're there, you go through this process that I think is somewhat analogous to the television reality shows like Survivor or The Amazing Race. And so you have a number of obstacle courses and steps that you have to pass. So uh, you're given sort of low-level tasks, and you're given bigger challenges. And at every level, you're scrutinized by partners who decide whether you get to go to the next level, whether you get to be a second-year associate or a third-year associate. But 
The problem with this process is it's very cost intensive. It's incredibly expensive. And as you've seen, the legal marketplace has changed in the past few years. Uh, what's happened is, you know, we have really have an international marketplace. You can't really do business anymore just domestically. You really have to be in involved in the international marketplace because what's happening in China or India can affect business here. Uh, we have computers uh, which are changing the nature of work that law firms do. Some of the sort of bread and butter low end tasks that associates initially did or paralegals did are now being done by computers. Um, the other thing is that we see that law firms are in some ways, a lot of law firms are struggling in this environment to survive. So you've also seen a lot of large law firms recently in the last 20 years have just collapsed, you know, which is, you really wouldn't have thought about that, you know, 20 years ago that a law firm wouldn't necessarily go bankrupt. So you have this very sort of competitive environment that law firms now exist in. And so that means that if you're using a sort of hiring, training, uh, retention kind of practices that are cost intensive, you know, puts a heavy load on firms. And in many ways, uh, they no longer have the resources to sustain this high attrition that they create with the way that they have traditionally selected talent and developed talent. Uh, they also have the problem, which you may or may not be familiar with, that corporations are looking and saying, well, we don't want to pay a first year associate three or four hundred dollars to do our work. You know, we don't want to be in the business of training associates because traditionally you be associate, you're, you're you know, assigned to a partner, they give you work and, and then you're billed out to the clients. So corporate corporations are carefully scrutinizing their bills and saying, we're not going to pay training costs for you. So then the firm has to pay those costs. So they need, and the other problem is that partners who have purportedly played a key role in training associates, and when you're assigned to a partner, theoretically they're supposed to help you develop your legal skills. I'm not sure if this is always the case. Um, when I worked at a law firm, it was more like get the work done, <laughs> and uh, you know we don't like it. Uh, you'll you'll get a uh, bad mark next to your name. Uh, so I didn't find that uh, I actually got that much training. <coughs> but the thing is, is that partners now have incredible pressures on them. They have to develop business, and if you don't develop a large, what they call, book of business, then you may no longer be a partner. You may follow some of your associates that uh, you worked with out the door. So this is also a problem that law firms are facing. <coughs> so law firms, in many ways, need to sort of rethink how they do business and how they develop talent, how they train talent, how they select talent, so that they can find ways to make this process really cost effective. So what I'm going to talk about today, and I will put up some of my slides here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a concept that I developed in the course of writing my book. Uh, what I do and what I've done for the past seven or eight years is study how people become successful in the workplace. And what I do is I look at interviews, autobiographical material, and the question I'm asking is, what do people do? I'm not interested in their personality, what they're like, but I'm really interested in how they go about generating successful outcomes in their lives. And the reason for that is I think that's the most <coughs> useful approach because 
a lot, I see a lot of people fail in the workplace because they don't have a good template. They don't have some sort of diagram that says you need to do this, you need to do that. You don't have a series of actions or a how-to manual on how to succeed. And if you think about it, you know, if you look at something like sports, you know, there's all sorts of techniques you need to <coughs> learn to be a good tennis player or a great hockey player. But when it comes to becoming highly successful in the workplace, there's nothing out there, except possibly, I hope, my book, <laughs> that can help you um, do that. So that was the kind of question that I was interested in answering. And what I discovered, I discovered a number of things, and I'm just going to talk about one of the uh, things that I discovered about highly successful people. What I discovered is that people who are highly successful know what they do really well. They know what I term, have termed their mini strengths. These are not the big things that people do, but the little things. So I want to, I call them mini strengths. And they're really in touch with what is generating their success. And what they do is they leverage it in the workplace. They don't put themselves in positions where they have to rely on their weaknesses. Instead, they place themselves in positions where they can capitalize on their strengths. So here's some of the people from my study. Uh, I now am looking at people in India and also China. As Dan may have mentioned, um, I'm doing an Indian version of my book uh, using people in India who have become highly successful, which will come out in August. So I've looked at the Liu family from Sintron, uh, who developed a highly successful feed business. Richard Branson, who uh, developed the <coughs> uh, Virgin Group of Businesses. Uh, Jack Welch, who probably you know was the uh, highly touted CEO of General Electric for many years. Uh, Anita Roddick, who founded The Body Shop. Uh, our own Charles Ogletree, who you may know, who was my mentor when I was at Harvard Law School, and Steve Jobs. These are some of the people who I've looked at. I've looked at over 70 people at this point, trying to sort of pinpoint the actions <laughs> that they take that make them successful. So, and I, in selecting the people that I looked at, I also had certain criteria. I, d I wanted to look at people who really make a difference, do something of value. In the kind of economy we have, uh, we often have people who become famous. They're um, on the television or the internet all the time. But when you actually look at it, they don't produce something that's of value and that adds value to the economy or adds value to the lives of other people. So I wanted to. Uh, use and, and I think that hurts the economy, you know, in many ways, and it, it takes jobs away from other people. And in some ways, that's what happened in the financial crisis that occurred in 2008. Was you know, <coughs> a lot of people who had their hands out as the money went by. There were a lot of people <laughs> collecting percentages on that money that really, you know, didn't add much to the uh, to the overall product. So, and when you look at people who become really famous, this one interesting thing is, you know, somebody like Warren Buffett is not just interested in making money. He's interested in picking companies that will succeed. Money, you know, is the measure of how well he's doing. But he himself lives very frugally. He still lives in a house that he bought in the 50s. He made a few modifications, but, uh, He's, he's not a flamboyant kind of presence. Uh, Sam Walton, who founded Walmart, he was not interested in fame at all. Uh, he was once invited to a famous movie star's uh, birthday party, and his thought was, well, why would I want to go to her birthday party? I don't even know her. And uh, so these people are really interested in product. And I think you see that with people, too, like Steve Jobs. 
you know, very fussy about the type and the quality of products that Apple produced. So let me explain what mini strengths are because I think uh, it's very useful for all of you to know uh, since you will be out in the workplace uh, soon. And in many ways, in today's workplace, you need to know what you do well. You need to take charge of your careers because uh, it's hard to find mentors. It's hard to find people who will sort of show you always the right way to go. And if you know your many strengths, it will give you an edge. <coughs> so I use this diagram here because I think of many strengths as sort of the building blocks of success. If you look here, there's all these little tiny pieces. You can think of those as the behaviors that we put together to build beautiful structures, which are our career outcomes. So uh, many strengths essentially are almost like these behind the scene tiny behaviors that we really don't notice. But the many strengths are those little behaviors that are really essential to our success. So let me give you a sort of mathematical model of this. Everything that we do, every result that we produce is the result of putting together a series of little actions or behaviors. Um, most of your students, you think about how you uh, do well on an exam, it's not just writing the words on the page. There's a whole, when you're taking your examination, it's a whole series of little behaviors that you've used to get to the point where you have something to say when you're in the examination. So every, so what we do is there's this cognitive and, and sometimes physical behaviors that we string together. And some of those behaviors are critical to the success of our outcome. And if we do them really well, uh, we'll have a great result. Not every behavior that we engage in is essential. So if you're taking an exam, uh, going to the coop and buying the book uh, for the course is maybe not essential to your success. I guess you could argue because you're all lawyers that it does have an element of, of uh, making you successful, but it's really uh, how you study and the cognitive behaviors that follow that dictate your success. So <coughs> essentially, if you have those mini strengths, if you have behaviors that are mini strengths that are critical to the success of an outcome, that will make the difference between you producing an average result or producing a really great result. And I'm going to give you some examples because I think it'll, it'll put, make this a little easier concept to digest. So let's look at Bill Clinton. Uh, one of the things that has made him really highly successful, uh, both in getting um, you know, elected president and also in dealing with Congress, is that he had an amazing capacity to emotionally connect with people very quickly. You know, when he was campaigning, people would talk about how he'd stop and talk to them for a few seconds or a minute or two, and they'd feel like, you know, they really liked him, like he was a friend, he was someone that they could speak to. So uh, when you think about this kind of mini strength of being able to sort of instantly emotionally connect with people, when you then think about the, think about it in terms of the context of a law firm where you have to bring in business, that's a great mini strength to be successful and bringing in business. People like to give business to people they like. Uh, you know, sometimes you think it's really the marketing materials, it's you know, the product that you're going to deliver, but at the end of the day, if they like you and they feel an emotional connection with you, uh, they're more likely to give you business. The same when you're um, being, in, being interviewed by a firm. You know, a lot of where, whether you're hired or not is whether you emotionally connect with the people at the firm, whether they like you. Uh, where's the thing? Whoops. 
Uh, another interesting mini strength that I found is that Warren Buffett has this incredible capacity to remember numbers. And if you think about someone who has to be looking at different financial statements, um, comparing things like return on investment across different quarters, the fact that you can remember numbers, that he can remember numbers, means they doesn't have to keep leafing through these papers. Oh, what was, what was the return on investment <coughs> last quarter versus you know, two years ago? Uh, so this really gives him an edge in thinking about and deciding what kind of businesses to buy and assessing uh, the financial worth of different kinds of companies. And, but you can look at people, you might not be good at, what I find is that people have different mini strengths in this area. Some people are good at remembering names. Uh, some people are remembering events. Some people are good at remembering factual details. Uh, some people are good at remembering stories. Uh, I know for myself personally, one of the things, which is kind of odd mini strength, but I can meet someone at a party or somewhere and they can tell me some story about something that happened to them or something about their life and I, I may see them five years later. I don't remember their name. I'm not good at facial recognition. But if I can connect the story, then, I re then it all comes back. And I'm like, oh yes, you were the person who told me about such and such. And they just look at me like, how did you know that? <laughs> and, and I say, well, you told me that when we met last time. But if you look at people, we have this sort of, everyone has many strengths. We all have little things that we really do well. The problem is, is that they, we don't notice them because everybody's looking at the results. And what we're rewarded to as we grow, what we're rewarded for as we grow up are the results that we produce. We're rewarded for getting an A on an exam. We're not rewarded for the fact that we really remembered every number in the material that we studied for that examination. So we miss these many strengths. Um, another great uh, mini strength that I like is Larry Ellison who founded Oracle is great at asking questions and he talks about how when from the time when he was a small <coughs> child he was always asking the questions that teachers didn't want to have asked so he was always in trouble but in developing software uh, you really need to think about every contingency every kind of aspect of the process and it's a great mini strength to have in helping people think out their software development so that they've considered all the possibilities, all the actions, all the responses that someone might make in using that software. It's also a great mini strength for uh, legal practice because if you think about it when you're interviewing a client, have you gotten all the information from them? Are you listening and figuring out what they haven't told you? And so asking those questions or for interviewing witnesses, uh, again, a wonderful mini strength is the capacity to answer great questions. But not everybody, not everybody can do it. And it's something that uh, Jack Welch was really good at. Uh, when he ran GE, he was, when he was, well, actually, when he was head of the plastics division, he would fly out on Mondays to the plants that he managed. He would take the plant manager, he'd put him in a little room, and he would question him and question him, the poor guy, all day. But the good thing was, you know, he would ask question after question, but he was very good at listening. And one of the great talents he had was the ability to see the gaps in the information that the person was providing. In other words, if you listen to people describe something or tell you about something they've done, there will be places where they leave out information or there are inconsistencies. And he's very good at noticing <coughs> that, which is something uh, which in the legal profession is highly useful if you're cross-examining someone. When you're cross-examining, you need to be able to listen, you need to be 
thinking, okay, does that make sense in terms of what they've told me before? Is that consistent? And then you can come out and say, well, um, you know, you can come out with a great response and show that they're inconsistent or their story doesn't make sense. So these are some of the little <coughs> types of uh, mini strengths that I've observed in people that become highly successful. And as you can see, there's our, our little things. There are little things that we really don't notice. But when you learn about them and you start watching people, you, you'll begin to see them. You'll begin to see things that people do that are actually quite amazing. But one of the problems is, is that we often don't notice them. And there's a couple of reasons for that is that um, they're usually things that we do really easily. And I don't know if you've ever had the situation where you've been doing something and somebody is just really impressed by how you do it. And you think, well, I always do it this way. You know, that's just how I do it. And so sometimes we undervalue the things that we do really well because your many strengths, if there's many strengths embedded in this, in this series of behaviors that you're doing, they're the things that, you know, it makes it flow. It makes it move really easily. Uh, and the other thing is, is that I think the American culture uh, very much uh, sort of perpetuates what I think is, is a bit of a myth, is the idea that if you put in enough effort, you can be good at anything. And if you think about it, think about things that you don't do well. And think about if you study that and worked on it for several years. You might become average at it, but it's highly unlikely that you would become super good at it. But everyone believes that, oh, if I go back to school and I do this or I study this, I'll become you know, really good at something. But what I found with people who become highly successful is they don't waste time on their weaknesses. If they don't do something well, they find someone else to do it. And this is a far more successful strategy than beating yourself up and spending hours trying to become good at it. So the result, though, is that people put themselves in wrong positions. As you go and enter law firms, if you, you choose that track, you, know, you do have some choice in where you go and what you do. And the value of knowing your many strengths is that you can think about you know, what area you're going to practice in and what you're going to do, not necessarily in terms of you know, the practice area, but in terms of what you do well. And be always thinking about how you're going to lobby for getting yourself put somewhere where you'll be relying on more of your many strengths and not be relying on your weaknesses. <coughs> and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who went here, and he was saying, well, you know, when I went into a law firm, you know, I knew he's a, he's a great business litigator. <laughs> it's perfect for him. And, but when he went into the firm, he very much lobbied to be put in an area of litigation. And I don't think it was conscious. I was thinking it was unconscious. But he put himself in a place that really played to his many strengths. Uh, personally, when I went to law firm, I was too intimidated to, uh, <laughs> uh, to ask, because I think at that point for women, law firms were much more uh, intimidating. I ho or let's hope they're not as intimidating as they were uh, when I went to a law firm. But it's very important, though, to know your many strengths and not to waste time working on your weaknesses. And uh, there's a very interesting study that was done at Cornell by uh, Kruger and Dunning, uh, which shows that we really have a very poor idea of what we do well. And what they did was they, uh, they had student subjects, and they gave them a series of tests. And after they left the test, they asked them to estimate how well they did. And what they discovered was that the people that did really well underestimated how well they did. Because again, it was pro uh, um, 
Wait a minute, I'll get back to that. And the people who do really poorly grossly overestimated how well they did. And, and that's in part because we, are, we just don't know, we somehow or other are not good observers of how well we do things. And if we do something really badly, one of the problems is, is we don't see the fine kind of distinctions and the gradiated levels that are involved in doing it well. So you can think of something like music. If you're tone deaf, you may not know that you're singing off key. Or if you are not good at identifying rhythms, you're not going to know that you're off the beat. So it's kind of a losing situation. If you do something badly, you're, you may not be able to notice, it, notice how badly you're doing it. If you do it really well, let's say you have perfect pitch, you're going to hear that slight, <coughs> that you're slightly off key when you're singing. So you're going to be more critical of what you're doing because you can see those kind of distinctions that other people can't see. So that actually is one of the reasons why it's difficult for us to always know what our many strengths are and you know, what we do really, really well. So, the good news though is that when you learn about many strengths is that you all have talent. Uh, you all, everybody has many strengths. So, it's just a case of knowing what they are. Each of us have a unique set of many strengths that are embedded in our DNA. And the interesting thing about the research that's being done today on DNA is that we're discovering that everybody is biologically unique. You know, originally they would talk about how everybody shared enormous amounts of <coughs> genetic material in common. But what they're discovering is that people differ, that people have, you know, minor biological differences that make a difference and where they're finding this really valuable is in the treatment of diseases like cancer where one day they think they'll have designer drugs for everybody. You'll have a drug formulated just for your particular biological profile. But we haven't made as many advances in understanding how the brain works and our cognitive functions, but what people are, neuroscientists are finding is that people differ, there are lots of differences in how people cognitively process information, how they receive information. A lot of research has been done on children that have you know, developmental disorders and they find these minor slight variations and in how they're processing information. Uh, and these can be, as I'll explain to you, these can be a strength as well as a weakness. And what's important is to know how you do that and how you can capitalize on it. <coughs> so, so if you look at many strengths, one of the things that's interesting is that there's many ways to do tasks. And so, when you're aware of your many strengths, not everybody does things the same way. So, an interesting example of that is this archer from Korea who was quite successful in the 2012 Olympics in London. And he's legally blind. So, I think one eye is 2200 or something, another. 2100, uh, so he can barely see. But it turns out with archery, which I didn't know, is that the target is so far away, it's not necessarily an advantage, disadvantage to not be able to see that well. But uh, so people were all marveling, oh my goodness, he's legally blind and he just had the best score of anyone. He broke, you know, he had a record breaking score at the beginning of the Olympics. And, but what he said was that he has this incredible color vision. So if you think about a target, you know, what you're going to see is the colors. And if your ability to see colors is extremely acute, 
it w may actually be an advantage because when you're given eye tests, you know, you're just looking at these black and white letters uh, that are a certain distance away. And, and that really doesn't capture our vision. You know, the most interesting thing about the eye is that there's many dimensions to vision. There's color vision, there's peripheral vision, there's motion vision, uh, there's the ability of your lens to adjust as you come back and forth. Uh, people are differences in the range of, of how their eyes respond. And each of those can give you an edge, like it gave the um, archer an edge, was the fact that, well, maybe his regular vision on a normal eye test is not that good, but the fact that he's so sensitive to colors uh, gives him an edge. I always look at Lady Gaga, who, you know, her, her, this, you know, her performances, she has these elaborate stages and so on, and she talks about how she spends hours deciding on exactly what color red she's going to use or something like this, and I look at that and I think, ah, she must have incredible color vision, and that helps, you know, create these really interesting sets that she has that uh, because of this, you know, very great sensitivity, and that's an example of a mini strength and how uh, someone can use it to be successful. So the other thing about mini strengths is that uh, when you look at people, you begin to see strengths that are not traditionally recognized. When you open your mind, and you stop focusing on results, what the outcome is, and you start looking at how people do things, you will see amazing talents that you don't think exist. And I think uh, in developing potential, uh, it's very important to understand that, uh, to understand that people do things many ways, and just because they don't do it the same way that you do it doesn't mean they're not going to produce a great result. And so I think one of the interesting uh, stories is the story of Temple Grandin, who was born with autism. And at age two, her parents took her to her doctor and they said that her parents should institutionalize her. But her parents, you know, just didn't give up on her. Her mother was incredibly strong and she decided, you know, that she was going to teach her daughter you know, how to read and do these things which were incredibly difficult for her. And so she worked with her, she hired extra people. Luckily they had the resources to do this. And this was a long time ago. This was like maybe 30 years ago when there aren't the kind of services that exist today. And so with great difficulty, she was able to eventually get through school, learn how to read. She had a terrible problem with language. She had a lot of trouble learning how to speak, to understand language. She was hypersensitive to loud sounds, <coughs> and she was also hypersensitive to visual stimuli. Well, she eventually discovered as she got through college, she was always felt, you know, connected with animals and her, I think her aunt had a um, cattle farm or ranch uh, and she, out there. And what she discovered, what she eventually, as she was able to use language is, it turns out that the way she functions is that she thinks in pictures. So when we think of a word, we just, we don't really have to have a visual image to go with that word. But she thinks in pictures, so if you, she thinks, if you mention the word under, the way that she learned it was to think of crawling under something. And then the other mini strength that she has is incredible mechanical abilities. When she was a child, she would, you know, design these amazing paper airplanes that would fly all over the place. And so here was someone who obviously we would think would have no, uh, you know, talents or abilities that had these particular mini strengths. So she found a place where she could use them and be highly successful. And that was, you know, designing um, these areas where they take cattle before they're 
slaughtered and so on, or feedlots and so on, where they have to go through these narrow kind of chutes. And <coughs> animals often balk and they won't go through these chutes. And because she's so attuned to visual images and thought in visual images, and also sensitive to sound and light, uh, she's been able to design these in more humane ways so that the cattle will feel safer and will move through these areas comfortably. And she'll be able to look at it and say, well, you know, the, the, ca the cattle are balking at this area because of the shadows and the, the way the light is coming in. So she's able to see something that the rest of us who don't think in pictures would never have noticed. And the other thing that she's able to do is she's able to visualize uh, all sorts of mechanical devices. So she can design a, a fila without a blueprint, without a piece of paper, and she can you know, see this whole thing in her mind, and she can even you know, troubleshoot like whether a latch will work or not, or w which direction it can go in, without having to try it out. So she's designed most of these um, holding areas for cattle and so on, uh, probably a third of them in the United States, and become a world-famous um, animal behaviorist. And so this is an example of how you know, people can, all of us have amazing mini strengths. The problem is, we don't identify them. Other people don't identify them. But, and the other problem is they're often masked by our weaknesses. You know, the things, the fact that she has so much trouble learning how to read is people just thought she's not too bright. You know, she'll never survive. She, you know, must have a really low IQ. Whereas it turns out she's brilliant in these particular areas. So let me talk a little about law firms. Uh, in terms of a model for law firms, which I think will help them survive more and more effectively develop uh, and recruit and, and identify talent and retain talent. And the model that I would propose is one based on sports teams. Because if you look at sports teams, they really look at people's many strengths. They look at the little things that people do really well. Uh, some of you may be familiar, you know, they have the NFL combine where they bring people in, potential uh, people that they're going to choose or uh, select, and they measure them on every detail of their performance. You know, they don't just measure how fast you run, they're going to be looking at things that how fast you accelerate, how fast you can go right, how fast you can go left. Uh, they look at, if you're a quarterback, they're looking at your vision, how, how good is your peripheral vision, how good is your motion vision, because you have to have good motion vision, how good um, do you have astigmatism, because if you have astigmatism, it blurs the edges, so you might not find the person you want to throw the ball to as everybody is moving around <laughs> in the field. But, they're much, they're very good at looking at every little thing that people do really well. Uh, they look at endurance. Uh, and so when you read about sports, you look at they, you know, coaches are always looking for the little things that people do really well. Uh, for example, Michael Phelps, won, who's won all these um, gold medals in swimming, has a giant feet. <laughs> so people look at him and say, you know, one reason he's a great swimmer is because he has feet that are like flippers, you know, they're so big. And uh, so, but if you're a coach, that's what you're looking for. Somebody walks in, they have big feet, you're like, great, <laughs> I want to coach you. <laughs> and, and so uh, in professional sports, they, they pay attention to all these different types of talent. And a good coach looks at it and thinks about how he's going to use different people, what kind of plays he's going to design that will take advantage of the set of many strengths that exist in the players that he has. So in part, law <laughs> firms to be successful and to deal with this problem of bringing in talent really need to start looking at people's many strengths and not just where they went to school. Uh, 
now that may not be an advantage to you. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, they should look at the people and start thinking about, well, what does this person really do well? And if you think about the law, you can think about how you know, different areas take different types of mini strengths. You know, if you're going to be doing something like contracts, you have to be really good at details. And you have to, you know, notice fine little details or tax. Or if you're doing uh, patents, you may want somebody like Temple Grandin <laughs> who can see everything in three dimensions and visualize things. You want to hire her as a consultant to help you, uh, you know, do the patent work. Uh, if you're doing litigation, uh, different sets of skills and different parts of litigation take different skills. If you're doing oral argument, you, there's special many strengths you need for that. You need to be able to uh, be able to listen carefully, uh, respond quickly to judges' questions, and to be able to listen closely and then figure out what case law what facts are relevant to what the judge is asking and respond on your feet. And some people are really good at that. Other people are much better when they have time you know, to write their brief and they, they're, they're not on the spot. Uh, some people are very good at influencing juries and people differ as to what kind of juries they're good at influencing. So law firms could save themselves a lot of money if they assess what they need in terms of many strengths. And also look ahead and think about, well, what kind of many strengths am I going to be losing in the next five years? Who's retiring? Who's getting old? Who's, who's leaving? What kind of associates do I need to bring in to fill those gaps? And so they need to look at potential hires as people who have Lots of probably hidden mini strengths and talents that aren't apparent uh, based on where they graduated from. And they also have to look at the conflict that exists when you think about this whole partnership kind of track process is that what it takes to be a great partner is the ability to bring in business. But if you think about the kind of mini strengths that you actually need to practice and to deliver a good product to clients, it's often very different than the kind of mini strengths that you need to uh, bring in business. For example, as I mentioned before, being able to emotionally connect with people is a great mini strength uh, for bringing in business. I once um, interviewed someone, it was really interesting was uh, they were telling me that when they were uh, talking to a potential client, they would say, I'd be sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'd know what they were worried about. I'd know what their fears were. Once I knew that, I knew I could get that business. And so the question is, when I thought about it, I thought, well, that person might be very sensitive to people's nonverbal behavior. They may have the vision to read people's faces so they can see the anxiety or the anxiety in somebody's body language when they touch on certain topics, but that's a mini strength. A lot of us talk to people who have no idea whether they're happy or anxious or worried. Um, so, but that would make you a great partner because you would be able to bring in lots of business in that situation. But it might not, not help you in all cases as a lawyer. It might help you in reading the jury, seeing whether what you're saying to the jury is actually appealing to them. Uh, another thing is that partners are, you know, they manage cases. Another entire set of different kind of mini strengths are needed to manage cases. And those aren't the ones that you're necessarily using when you're actually writing briefs or uh, doing document discovery or reviewing documents. And the third one is developing associates. Those are three areas that really, in a way, don't go together. You know, when you develop associates, you need to sort of be really good at developing people, nurturing them, 
uh, explaining things clearly. Another kind of mini strength. So, in some ways, uh, what I would argue is that firms should focus on, you know, identifying uh, associates' mini strengths and targeting training. As I mentioned, if you don't have particular particular mini strengths for a certain area, no amount of training is going to make you super good at it. So in some ways, it's a waste of time to train people in certain areas because they'll just end up being average. And maybe you want them to be average sometimes. But what may happen is that firms are sort of shooting themselves in the foot in some ways the way that this process works because Somebody who's going to be a great partner may easily be bounced out because they're terrible at details, or they're terrible at reviewing documents, or they're terrible at doing research. So I think the whole process needs to really be rethought. But for you, as students, I think that you can really give yourself an edge in the workplace if you start looking around and watching yourself and saying, what do I really do well? What is really easy for me? And the really nice thing about doing that is that when you discover what you do really well and easily and you kind of play to that, it's much easier. Uh, you get a lot more joy out of your work uh, because you're not kind of distracted trying to think about whether you're doing it right or not. Uh, you get a lot of pleasure. You're more likely to work in the zone or in a state of flow where everything moves quickly and wonderfully. So you get a lot more satisfaction out of your work. Uh, it won't be so hard to put in a 60 hour a week if you're doing something that you uh, really like. So um, I hope that this will help you uh, build more successful careers. Uh, there's many other dimensions to uh, building a successful career, so um, which I've written about in my book, uh, which you may find helpful. And uh, so I wish you all great success and, and hope this is giving you a different way of looking, looking at yourselves and also appreciating yourselves because uh, you've all got talent. It may not be exactly the same, but uh, it's there.